ask you to silence your cell phones if you could. Uh, thanks so much, and even just starting off, I really uh, do, I want to thank Ryan for his leadership in announcing this all to you, helping us get reserved. Uh, you know, you, there's talks offered to you guys all the time, but there's a lot of logistical work. Christine Rembler's here, who works with me, and simply getting the pizza here on time is sometimes a major coup, so we're grateful <laughs> for their assistance and help. Just a disclaimer, if I could, at the beginning. I was an infantry officer before I studied medicine. I studied medicine over at Rush. And then ethics, because I, I was called to the clergy, um, ethics was sort of a shoo-in, because there's a lot of questions of, you know, right and wrong, what should we, what shouldn't we do? And uh, so I do, it's true, have a certain number of, of sectors that I've studied, but it really is true that the master, the jack of all trades, really is the master of none. And like sometimes instead of like you know the high speed medic ranger person like that, you know I really feel like my medical knowledge base is really really simple. So presumably we have something to share with you. Uh, we say uh, take what you like and leave the rest, or at least think about what we've said. So one of the things that we want to talk about here today is you know is there a right way or a wrong way to practice medicine? And the reason this topic came up is there's really a question I think in the modern world today is do right and wrong exist? Can we know them? And it manifests itself in different ways. I was at the graduation ceremony last year of the M4s, now MDs, and what was proposed at the graduation ceremony was, well, you could be a neurosurgeon up in Lake Forest, a wealthy part of Chicago, or you could be down on the south side working in a free clinic or a Cook County hospital. You could be a researcher. And you could be other different kinds of practitioners, either within the uh, practice of nursing or medicine. And the statement was made, uh, there is no right way to practice medicine. Now, that's sort of a straw man's argument. We can take it apart. I think the, the speaker would backpedal if he said, there's no wrong way whatsoever to practice medicine. But to think that all these are co-equal raises this question. Is there a right or a wrong way and can we know it? And for example, I just put a picture of a morula up here, you know, the question of embryonic stem cell destruction and embryonic stem cell harvesting has come up and can we know whether it's right or wrong to break up a, a, a group of 16 cells that are a human, you know, nascent embryo or a morula at that point? Antecedent to that whole question is in the philosophical world, the question of whether the truth actually exists and whether we can know it, you know. Can we know the truth? So what we're going to talk about a little today is those questions in the light of a case study and talk about maybe some right and wrong ways to practice and this question of whether the truth exists. I'm going to give you a couple models of ethical theory that you're going to run across during your careers. There's several models of thinking, and people use different ones different times in different cases. But what we're going to do over the next couple lectures, both this semester and in the next semester, is maybe do one of those models in each lecture. So today's sort of an introduction to medical ethics, why should I care, what does it matter? Okay, so the case for your edification is, that's not just a bad case of Ampelite's foot. This is a 24-year-old woman in a community hospital, and this is a case I came across when I was a medical student. She had dry gangrene of the foot, right, and so that toe is, is going to go away one way or the other. Surgery was recommending amputation for more than several days to her. ID, the infectious disease consultants, had been asked to see her, and they concurred. But the patient was repeatedly refusing the amputation of this toe. She just couldn't deal with the idea. She didn't want it amputated. And she was conscious and uh, able to make her own decisions. And she refused. Psych was consulted. A lot of times people try to bring psych in on a case like this. They noted she had a mild depression and started some antidepressant, and the gangrene was progressing. So just for a little exercise for you guys, what I'd like you to do is just turn to the person next to you in either two or three, and if you, if you were the lead caretaker on this patient, 
what would you do? She's refusing an amputation. How would you proceed? And what, how would you know if what you're doing was right, if you're able to discuss that? Just take, we will take about two or three minutes. You can bounce your ideas off each other and you can pair or triple off as seems good to you. that you felt comfortable with in terms of how to proceed with a woman like this that you're willing to share? Um, my number one concern was that if, since the only stated reason we have is her going, I just can't, I just can't, um, that's sort of trademark defense mechanism. That's not an articulated understanding of what's going on with her. And if she's in denial, uh, we need to sit down and have a very long conversation with her. I don't know how that happens in the district of the hospital. But I need that long conversation. And until she can state for me clearly, like, no, I would actually prefer death over losing my toe, until she can actually clearly articulate that, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep trying to treat her. Mm -hmm. OK, so some more conversation and fact finding. Anybody else? We talked about trying to bring in family members, uh, maybe explaining the situation to them, they could reach the patient better than the doctors could. Okay, so get some consultation with some family members for herself. Anything more radical? Cut it off. <laughs> All right, so what's that in the back? <laughs> Cut it off. Cut it off. All right. <laughs> Listen, that's proposed often when this case is discussed. She doesn't know what she's doing. We're taking her to the OR. It's coming off. And I remember we discussed a case very similar to this when I was an M1 and uh, over at Rush, and the guy sitting next to me said, no, you take her to the OR, you put her to sleep, and you cut it off, period. And uh, some people would propose that as a course of action. You might have difficulty getting the rest of the hospital to buy off on, on that. Uh, what we're going to talk about is some of the ways of thinking through a situation like that in order to come to a good decision, because there are there are systems of thought that we can use, not just to say, well, I think it should come off, or I feel like this is upsetting, or, uh, but an actual approach to making a good decision about how to help a patient like that. Uh, are there right or wrong ways to practice medicine? That's the question that was asked. And it was proposed, as I said, in a graduation exercise, that no, there's no really right or wrong way to uh, practice medicine. I would propose to you that history suggests otherwise, right? So here what you see is an image of National Socialism in action in Europe in 1942 or 3 or so. And this are uh, physicians, 
conducting what were called immersion experiments on camp detainees without their permission, uh, immersing them in cold water to study the physiology. And the purpose of that was to see if downed Luftwaffe uh, flyers, how long they could survive if they were downed in the North Sea or in other cold water. So how many of you are familiar with those sorts of experiments that they took place and have seen that? A lot of people are, not everybody knows, but there was a lot of experimentation, certainly in that camp system in the 40s, that abused the human person, and globally, the medical uh, community has come out against that kind of medicine. Is there a right or a wrong way? Compare that with someone like Mother Teresa, who was not a physician, but provided hospice care, basically, and um, nurturing care to infants and children who'd been abandoned in India. And there's this great story about how she was just sort of living life in Calcutta, and she was in a train station, and there was a man laying on the ground, and people were literally just stepping over him. He was dying. He was in extremis, and apparently in this train station in Calcutta, that wasn't particularly remarkable. And you would step over like you might step over a box or something that might trip you. He was just laying there. And she saw him laying there, saw the people stepping over him, and actually, I think, commented that she almost could have as easily stepped over him, even though she was a sister in a religious community at that time. And she decided to stop and to help him instead of stepping over him. And that put in this whole movement of care of the dying, particularly in that particular place in India, for which she ultimately became a witness that went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. So, you know, those are two very dichotomous examples, but pretty clearly there are ways to know which is a right action and which is a better action. This is a picture of her and um, Princess Diana coming out after uh, I believe visiting uh, AIDS patients in, in London and uh, breaking a real barrier of touching a patient with HIV diagnosis, which was a thing that Princess Diana was kind of famous for having done because there was a real stigma and fear of even having contact, this is back in the, the 80s, uh, of touching somebody even that was uh, HIV seropositive. What other kinds of abuses have gone on? Well, right here in the United States, up until 1972, how many of you are familiar with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment? So some have heard about that, but not all. In Tuskegee, I think in Alabama, uh, African American men were recruited and intentionally infected with syphilis without their knowledge to study the natural course and progression, and I'm not sure if they studied the treatment, but of syphilis, and here they're seen doing a lumbar puncture to collect cerebrospinal fluid from one of the research subjects who had not been told that he had been infected with syphilis. And this is, you know, this is, yeah, a good 40 plus years ago. That's not that long ago. Like some of the attendings here would be able to remember, you know, the 70s. This wasn't done here. But Modern medical science, even in the United States of America, this kind of practice of medical research and medical care can and did take place. And it has repercussions still in the relationships between the medical community and the African American community. There's, there's not a lot of trust sometimes, especially if there's a big racial uh, gap between the patient and the provider. So we talked about that one already. And one other example I wanted to give you of the kinds of craziness that can go on is in, in 1963 in this country, there was these Milgram experiments took place where they would bring a, a subject in uh, and affix electrodes, and they would recruit somebody off the street to come in and say, we're studying how people respond to negative uh, influence, like being shocked in learning. And they were told, okay, your job is to shock this person if they don't respond appropriately. And they would shock them and say, okay, turn it up more intensely, intensely, intensely. And the people who had been recruited in this experiment were actually told ultimately to turn it up to a dial that said potentially lethal dose, that they might be electrocuting this person to death. And they would go ahead and push the button. 
And um, they were not told that they were participating in an experiment. So this was part of modern medical science as well. And uh, as, as some reflection was done on that in the country, the scientific community came together and came to some agreements about how to appropriately recruit research subjects and to conduct research. The reason I bring all those cases up is, can we know the difference between right and wrong? And as I said before, part of what we're asking when we ask that is, can we know anything? Can we know the truth? And if the truth exists, how do we get at it? This question has been going on for an extremely long time. People have sought knowledge. You're here seeking knowledge as uh, medical professionals and wanting to apply that knowledge. So you know how to assimilate certain kinds of knowledge. All human beings by nature desire to know. Aristotle says that's really what part of what makes us human. Yes, our reason, but our desire to retain information and use it. So about the truth. Two contradictory statements I would propose to you cannot both be true at the same time. Exclusive statements. So a statement like there is a truth when compared to a statement like, there is no truth. One of those is true and one is not. And it might be proposed to you that there is no truth or we cannot know the truth. This is a fundamental exercise in logic. If we cannot know the truth, that is a true statement. It has to be a true statement. So at least one thing is true. And if at least one thing is true, then two things are true. And we've just done that by human reason. That's how, so this is actually a very, I'm a Roman Catholic, right? So one of the reasons I'm here on campus is to give testimony to the truth. I'm here to give testimony that the truth exists because it's fundamental to our worldview and the way that we approach the practice of medicine or the practice of ethics. If it's true, that there is no truth, as I say, one thing's true. So stick that in the back of your head sometimes when people propose to you, uh, well, there might be something right or wrong here, but we cannot know it. We can know things, the truth exists, and there are standards that can be agreed upon in this. The scientific method. Now here you are at a big research university and teaching university. And, you know, what is the sine qua non, then, of, of modern medicine? Some people might say, well, you have to have a prospective double-blinded randomized trial in order to know something about a drug. And that's one way of knowing. You might want a systematic review of the literature, and that is one way of knowing. You might want to do a case control study. There are many ways that we get at medical truths, and some are better in some cases than others. But what I think is important to remember is you cannot prove using a randomized, blinded, prospective study that that's the only way to get at knowledge. You can't prove using the scientific method that the scientific method is the only way to get at knowledge. There are other fonts of knowledge in the world. We call them fonts of knowledge. Human experience, reflection, reason, and then there are, as we say, these other empirical mechanisms of gathering information. Certainly, given the excesses that I described, you know, in Europe, as I said, during the 40s, the med world medical community came together and the world community in general, and at Nuremberg, it was decided, you know, you can't, uh, you can't experiment on human beings medically. Here's, this is an image of a a subject that was being displayed at the Nuremberg trial and some scars on her legs from some uh, treatments that had been given to her that she did not accept. The World Declaration of Geneva, and I won't take you through every line, but it's basically the Hippocratic Oath that not only has negative prescriptions about how not to practice medicine, but it has positive prescriptions that you will respect life and that you will use conscience and dignity and the health of the patient will be the first consideration. And this is uh, you know, almost universally understood as the right way to practice medicine in the world today. In the United States, as a response to some of the excesses that I described to you, this Belmont Commission was put together in 1979. And it was a national commission to protect human research subjects 
in medical research and in behavioral research. And they came up basically with three principles that they felt really had to be expressed that were important part of our culture. The respect of persons, beneficence, and justice. And we'll talk more about those principles. So just to come back to a question that's central to what we're talking about here today, I think for you guys, often because you want to be practitioners, how many of you want to be clinical practitioners? How many of you never want to touch a patient? You're just here because you're going to get a PhD in molecular biology. You know, you know, we all came to this because we want to take care of people. So a question I think in the back of your mind is, how does this affect my practice? Does this matter? Or is it just some, in fact, we used to just call these sort of softball courses because you're studying biochemistry and histology and all these kind of hard science courses. And every once in a while they kind of throw something soft at you like um, sensitivity training or, um, or ethics are thought to be soft sometimes. I would, I'd say it's a harder science than what's proposed. Somebody, here's how this might affect your practice. This is a question that's out in the world. Does life begin at conception? Some people say yes, some people say no. It's a social question, it's a political question. It's a real question for a practitioner, right? Because you're gonna have patients come to you and say, uh, I want to proceed in such and such a way in my health care. And they might ask you to do something that you support, and they might ask you to do something you're ethically uh, uh, objecting to. And then the question does affect your practice. Or how do you, as a medical practitioner, who's much more familiar with the science behind these decisions, help your patients to make good, sound, medical, ethical decisions? And this is sort of the, the corollary to part of that is, is it okay to take a moral law apart, or does it just not matter? Does life begin at birth? Does this have a moral status? What if somebody were to propose to you that all of our lives began as a unicellular organism, every single person in this room? What if somebody were to propose to you that it did not, and that it began at another time? And this is part of the tools that we're gonna bring to these kinds of questions. So, uh, I'm cognizant of your time, so I just want to make sure we don't push too late. Um, there are several models of ethical thought that are widely used in medical practice today. One of the most ancient ones is the Hippocratic. Hippocrates, sometimes say, said to be the father of medicine. Principalism, which was one of the, two of the main uh, explicators of that were professors Beecham and Childress, and we'll talk a little more about principalism. A sort of a utilitarian or consequentialist uh, approach that might be exemplified by the thought of John uh, Stuart Mills and Jeremy Bentham, and a natural law approach, which is also a very universal truth, but also tied closely to Christianity and Catholicism. Aristotle's virtue ethics. And there's other ways of proceeding as well. So how about Hippocratic uh, Oath? Any of you familiar with the Hippocratic Oath? You know, well, how many of you really have ever read it? How many of you guys have ever read the Hippocratic Oath? Okay, Google it. I'm not going to put the whole thing up for you. What's, anybody know what the most famous line out of it is? Do no harm. Yeah, okay, primum non nutre, first do no harm. But also he proposes, you know, to do good in the Hippocratic Oath and some other negative actions as well. We have about 2,000 years of experience with the Hippocratic method. We have about 30 to 40 years of experience with kind of the more modern mo ethical models. So it's, it's worth a good look at the medical history to see why it was, you know, for 2,000 years that physicians in the West certainly almost universally thought, oh, this is the code of ethics we're going to hold ourselves to. So no, first do no harm. I will not give a deadly drug, so euthanasia was something which was being practiced in that time and it was something that they were uh, forbidding physicians to do, refraining from sexually uh, approaching your patients because you, of the, the difference in the power structure and your relationship that exists with them. And he has other precepts as well. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth of each of these models, just for today I just want to introduce four of like the big paradigms to you. So the Hippocratic. Then there's a principalist approach. And the principles that are proposed most ordinarily are of beneficence, of doing good. 
We want to help our patients, right? We join this, hopefully, to be agents for good in the world. Non-maleficence, not doing bad. That's sort of the primum non nocere, but to refrain from doing wrong or harming or damaging. Autonomy. So this is big in this gangrene case that we were talking about, right? If that woman has capacity to make decisions, where does her autonomy begin and end? And that's, of course, you know, in the respect life questions and on the abortion debates, that's the big one. Like, where does a woman's autonomy begin and where does it end? Where does the moral status of the conceptus begin and where does it end? And sometimes those things are not in clear dialogue. But autonomy today is huge. And um, sometimes they talk about you know, the ascendancy or the primacy of autonomy, where autonomy sort of becomes, shibboleth isn't the right word, but becomes sort of like this ultimate standard that no, none of the other standards can possibly trump. And that's not necessarily true either. And then the question of justice, right? You're going to run into this all the time. I had a guy come into my clinic uh, Saturday. He's indigent. He's undocumented. He'd been given a script for a medicine that cost $500. He didn't have $30. And uh, he was just turned out from the hospital with a bunch of English paperwork. He was Spanish speaking. Nobody in his house spoke Spanish. And there's some real questions of justice that you read about because of Obamacare and attempts to provide uh, Medicare, Medicaid, but this will come into your practice certainly, you know, because you're going to have people who cannot pay for their care come to you and want care, and you have to decide where to draw that line. Another model that's used is called a utilitarian or a consequentialist approach, and this is sort of like the greatest good to the greatest number. We have $50 million in the state of Illinois say that we can spend on X. And the government has, and policymakers have to decide. And um, the, one of the greatest early proponents of this model was uh, Jeremy Bentham. And uh, in the 18th century, he kind of worked up this philosophical system where you, you look at the consequences of any decision and basically attempt to come to help the greatest number of people and to harm perhaps the fewest would be a corollary of that. Interestingly, this Bentham guy had himself stuffed and uh, preserved by taxidermy. I hope this doesn't offend you. And this is him. And once a year, they open this box, and the disciples of his ethical model come and pay some respects still, even today. So I thought, if you want, you can be famous as an ethicist and really be a legacy. And, uh, so. Okay, so one other big model, the natural law, right? The natural law approach to ethics would say that right and wrong is really written on our hearts. And yes, we can be formed, we can be malformed, you could be raised in a community where you were really taught to live the opposite of good. But in reality, we know in our hearts what's right or wrong, we have a conscience, and that uh, by reflection on that and by communication, we can come to know it. I'll give you an example of the kind of value in, in my ethics that is that, that we can come to know that we respect vulnerable life. What that means might have to be debated. That we have a respect for the poorest among us. That's that thing with like Mother Teresa. Most people would say, that's a good thing that she did, it, taking care of a dying person that nobody was taking care of. So respect for the indigent, respect for the vulnerable, uh, we would say justice, certainly, and um, to do things as much as possible on a lower local level. But the natural law has been reflected upon also for a good, easy 700 years. There's powerful reflection on how the natural law can be understood. Um, you know, Thomas Aquinas was a big proponent of understanding how it can work in our everyday life. So this is just to stick in the back of your head that if you'd like to come to these lectures and eat free pizza and enjoy some fellowship, and I'll try to tell you some uh, good stories from our practice from time to time, these are the models that we're going to um, talk about. And actually, we're blessed to have with us Lisa Anderson Shaw from the Ethics Committee, who's going to be our next speaker. And she is going to unpack one of these models in a little more detail using a case-based approach as well. 
And so over the course of, of this semester and the next, we want to expose you just to the core content. I know you won't be able to make every single one, but we'd love to have you. Um, what I thought would be helpful perhaps is just to take a look at this case again, right? We talked about it for a minute and, um, and see if Take two or three minutes again with yourselves and your, your person. See if you've maybe changed what your thoughts were a little bit about if one of these approaches either appeals to you or that you fall into more naturally or that you should have considered. And just check in with each other and, and see if that you're, maybe you hadn't been able to formulate it in any of the words that I used, but we'll just take two minutes to discuss it that way. <clears throat> conversation taking place and we'll just ask the same question did just even naming these models give you a, a, anything that added to the way you were going to discuss it or did one seem to be more applicable to how to proceed would anybody be willing to share on that in the bank uh, kind of an abstract view of utilitarianism but doing cutting off the tone now is better for the greater good of our living mm -hmm. It's interesting because I was just, we were talking about this before the lecture is that when the stakes get high, often people lean towards utilitarianism. And a, a, a negative example that would be is, say, in counterterrorism. I, I was just talking about this the other day. Is when, if you're worried that a thermonuclear device is going to be detonated in downtown Chicago today, I hope it won't be, that waterboarding starts not to look so bad, you see. And people, when the stakes are really high, it doesn't make the action actually good. It just makes it sometimes less unpalatable because the good we're trying to achieve becomes so important. So saving her life might prompt us to say, we're going to ignore what principle? We would ignore her autonomy. It would prompt us to. It doesn't say that it'd be good to. I think another thing that jumped out at me was the issue of autonomy. Is her autonomy encroaching on my autonomy and my virtues of doing what I think is right? Because I am here to provide a service, but I also am a person with my own ideals and morals. And um, like, I'm at, 
there's a difference between not doing harm and then there's a doing kind of like is the bystander also as bad as the perpetrator question? Which is something that was visited in World War II, right? So this is a great question, and I'm going to come back to you, but I think one of your classmates wants to comment. Go ahead. I, just, I think like, it's tough to talk about autonomy when you're talking about another person's like, complete being. Like, as a physician, your autonomy is, like, I think autonomy needs to be thought of as like, still within yourself. And I think like, if you're encroaching on someone else's autonomy, it's considered, like, or at least I would consider it like, more bad than like, your autonomy as a physician to like, practice however you think is right. Sure, and we'll, well, I'll still come back to you, but go ahead if you're... No, I, I very much agree, and it's the, I think that's where humility becomes very important for doctors, is that we are not the hero of the story, we are the servant. We are someone else's sidekick. So this is fascinating because you have a utilitarian approach. We have a question about conscience and the merits of conscience, and we're going to have a whole one-day symposium next semester about where does a physician's conscience and the patient's conscience interface? It's a great question. And then here you have a virtue. I didn't really talk about Aristotle, but the virtues would be like courage, honesty, humility. Uh, and so you're raising the question of our own humility. Um, one thing I would propose in terms of limits on autonomy, if you had a 90-year-old person who had a long, long, long cardiac history, who's demanding a heart transplant, say. As a surgeon, you know, you do have your own autonomy and conscience to say, this is not indicated, I'm not doing it at some point. You might help them some other way. But there are limits to the patient's autonomy and there's limits to the physician's autonomy. And those are important to recognize. Uh, we have more that could be said, but I think this was a great start and I'm so pleased you came, it's a real treat. We're down in the basement in the Student Center West and, um, oh, I was going to represent that to you. Uh, I'll just end with this. What do you call a person who keeps talking when people are no longer interested? A teacher. But I can end there. So uh, we thank you for your attention. And if you want, we have a chapel. You can come pray, you can sit, meditate. If you want to talk to me about the clinic, you're welcome to. I'm there Saturdays. It's a free clinic, and you can volunteer if you like. And we'll hope to see you back. Uh, for the next lecture, which the date of which I can't remember. October 14th. October 14th. You'll get an email. Or 7th. Thanks. <laughs> and if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'll be up here. Thanks, everybody.